Let's talk. Let's talk about Elon Musk, and then we're going to get to the school shooting, or Tonight not school shooting, the ex- mass shooting. Exclusive Elon Musk's SpaceX says it's running out of money to fund the crucial satellite internet service that Ukrainian troops depend on daily in the battlefield. This comes amidst reports. So there's conflicting statements on this. Originally, I thought SpaceX was like, uh, because it needs receivers. I thought originally that SpaceX was like uh, fucking. Uh, I mean, not SpaceX. Sorry, I thought because it was uh, or uh, because you needed receivers. I thought that uh, the the Starlink satellite systems, like the satellite internet systems, were actually not exactly great for the Ukrainians. Sorry, I I had a brain fart moment there. But now, now he's saying, I can't fund it anymore. I can't keep it afloat. I can't keep it alive any longer. So I want more money from the U.S. government. Now, of course, that comes on the heels of Elon Musk talking to Vladimir Putin, as far as we understand, and then saying some kind of wild, somewhat, somewhat, sometimes somewhat sane, but sometimes kind of wild and insane statements that are uncharacteristic of Elon Musk. And very characteristic of Elon Musk. Basically saying just like full-blown surrender to, to Russia and, and give up any claims that you have within your own territorial borders, including eastern Ukraine. Um, and then, of course, that frustrated, understandably, Ukrainian leadership, who then turned around and said, fuck you, Elon Musk. You know? see yourself out of our affairs. And he immediately turned around and stated, okay, fuck me. Well, oops, I don't have any more money. The Pentagon has to give me money now for the Starlink shit. ...that Musk recently spoke directly to Vladimir Putin about the war. That is a report that Musk denies. Alex Marquard is out front. In Ukraine's fight to push out Russian invaders, one of the most critical pieces of technology doesn't fire rockets or bullets. It's small, easy-to-use satellite internet terminals called Starlink, made by SpaceX, the rocket and satellite company founded by Elon Musk. According to SpaceX, there are around 20,000 Starlink terminals in Ukraine, and they've been vital for soldiers' communication, flying drones, and artillery targeting. Starlink is the glue, really, between the forward-deployed drone and the artillery that's conducting uh, uh, the strike against Russian positions. Starlink arrived in Ukraine as the war started, earning Musk global praise and thanks. CNN has now exclusively obtained documents showing not only that SpaceX is just one part of a large international effort getting Starlink to Ukraine's front lines, but now, seven months into the war, SpaceX is warning the Pentagon it is facing the difficult choice of reducing or stopping service. Why at this moment uh, Starlink is raising this issue? It just, it's, it's, it's really bad timing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is it? Hey, guess what, dude? Maybe don't rely on fucking billionaires, okay? Maybe we shouldn't have a system where it's like one guy could just make this decision, you know what I mean? Oh, man, that's crazy. The company says it has spent almost $100 million and, quote, we are not in a position to further donate terminals to Ukraine or fund the existing terminals for an indefinite period of time. SpaceX has now requested the Pentagon pick up much of the tab, $124 million for the rest of 2022, a rate that would translate to close to $400 million for the next year. SpaceX is not a charity, of course, and... Um, they're losing a lot of money uh, right now as a business, so I'm sure they're trying to recoup some of their costs. SpaceX's request came after Ukraine's commanding general, Valery Zaluzhny, wrote in July directly to Musk, the letter obtained exclusively by CNN. Starlink units provide exceptional utility, the general wrote, then asked Musk for almost 8,000 more terminals. Instead, SpaceX said they told Ukraine to send their request to the Pentagon adding, we have now exceeded our original agreement with Ukraine. Without Starlink, Ukraine says it can't fight, 
Last week, reports emerged of widespread sudden Starlink outages on the front line as troops fought to take back territory. They are puzzled about why that's going on. Is that something that uh, SpaceX is doing intentionally? Um, is that coming from Elon? No one is quite sure. The outages and news of the funding request to the Pentagon come as Musk's support of Ukraine is also questioned. After he proposed a peace deal, suggesting that Ukraine relinquish Crimea to Russia and hold UN-backed referenda for parts of eastern Ukraine. He told a private audience that Ukraine doesn't want to talk about peace negotiations, while he says Russia would accept those terms. In the backlash that has followed, Elon Musk has repeatedly insisted that he's pro-Ukraine, just yesterday tweeting at a Ukrainian official who thanked him for the Starlink services, saying, you're most welcome, glad to support Ukraine. Now, in reality, Aaron, that support is more complicated. The documents that we saw show that SpaceX fully donated just 15% of the Starlink hardware. The terminals, uh, uh, those are the terminals, with the majority, 70% of the internet service. Now, the rest comes from countries like US, Poland, the UK, and other entities. Now, Aaron, at the same time, Musk is saying that he's glad to support Ukraine. His company is now saying that that, that support may soon slow down or end. SpaceX ignored our repeated request for comment, and a lawyer for Musk did not respond. Aaron. All right. Oxmark Card, thank you very much. I thought that was similar to the kind of diplomatic peace you want to. Has that changed? No, I, I am a fan of, of building an off ramp and ending this war. I'm an advocate for it. It's not pro state, it's pro war or anti war. I am anti-war. Reports say the soldiers were using their own credit cards to keep the Starlink up, so possibly Elon is not flipping the bill. Uh, footing the bill, you mean, right? So Elon Musk is whining about losing a lot of money on Starlinks for Ukraine. Meanwhile, may I present you the snippets of my bank statements? Thousands of Ukrainians paying his company monthly. So the question is, did you really lose more money than you earned? So he was already charging them? Uh, this is confusing. The Pentagon said that it was in talks with Elon Musk's Starlink mobile internet system to keep connectivity for Ukrainian forces after Musk complained he was burning through nearly $20 million a month funding the service. I mean, listen, color me surprised that Elon Musk saw a hot button issue and literally used it as a marketing opportunity for himself, okay, exclusively for himself, and then... And then secretly complained to the Pentagon to get more money for this. And is now also petulant and, and really fucking narcissistic and is mad that like Ukrainians got mad at him involving himself in, in you know, otherwise a brutal and bloody war. What's he going to do? Go over there and take a shit back, keep it, and tell him to go fuck himself? You, I mean, you can't. He could just stop the, the satellites from beaming information back, right? I mean, he could just end it. It doesn't work that way. He could just make it not work. <laughs> I'm surprised he hasn't called someone a pedophile yet. He literally induced the Ukrainians to rely on a service, then rug pulls them once they do. This is criminal, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, he did. He's such a piece of shit. <laughs> what exactly is the cost of the service? Those things are already in space. Can the cost offer should really be that high? Yeah. Bro, what do you mean? There's like upkeep. There's people that are fucking literally sitting on the ground monitoring that shit. Yeah, of course the costs are high. Are you saying? Are you saying like the upkeep of, of, of fucking satellite internet service is not going to be high? Like, of course the costs are going to be high.
And then he did this incredibly petty thing, which was really funny. Elon Musk Starlink says they can no longer afford to give Ukraine free service and ask the Pentagon to pay for it. Starlink has been a game changer in the war. This comes days after Ukrainian ambassador told Musk to fuck off. He turned around and he said, we're just following his recommendation. I love the Michaela tweet under it, though. He goes, I owe you an apology. I wasn't really familiar with your game. <laughs> that is the most petty shit I've ever seen. Like, he probably just wants to make money off of this, right? He, he did the PR thing. People forgot about the PR part. Now he wants to make more money off of it, right? He didn't have to say this part, but he did it anyway because he's a fucking psycho. He's a freak. He just, I mean, this is like, this is next level. Wonder if it's losing 20 millions a month is just how most corpos speak when they say losing in place of not getting X amount of money we could have. I mean, a little bit. Now, I don't know what's going on behind closed doors, but this is coming off the heels, like I said, of Elon Musk having private, potentially private conversations with Vladimir Putin. He did say that. He had had conversations with Vladimir Putin. He did, did, he did get liberals like me on board with nationalization. Also, there was no extra cost. These are all satellites. SpaceX already planned to launch. U.S. EU government pay for 70% of the hardware costs on the ground. But then fucking nationalize it again. Definitely, Elon Musk is among the world's top private donors supporting Ukraine. Starlink is an essential element of our critical infrastructure, says Mikhailo Fedorov, uh, the vice prime minister of Ukraine, which Elon Musk apparently uh, personally liked this tweet. And people are yelling at the impasse. <laughs> God, I love this story. I don't want to, I play no role in this, okay? I am completely outside. I'm looking at this completely from the outside, okay? It's fucking hilarious. Because Elon Musk stands are now yelling at the fucking vice prime minister of Ukraine because his ambassador popped off on Elon Musk, the deity. The Holy Lord. It's awesome. People straight up are like, dude, what do you mean? Demonstrate your fealty to our Lord immediately. Are you crazy? How dare you? Why would the Ukrainian ambassador say fuck off to a guy whose service is important to Ukraine? The former ambassador to Germany who told Musk to fuck off is also the same guy who got recalled because he denied Bandera's anti-Semitism law. I mean, that's, you know, part and parcel. It's going to happen. That's the least shocking piece of information I've, I've heard in this process. Oh, here it was. I, I remember seeing this. He said, fuck off to Elon Musk. Fuck off is my very diplomatic reply to you. After Elon said, Ukraine, Russia, peace, redo elections and annex regions under UN supervision. Russia leaves if that is the will of the people. Crimea, formerly part of Russia, as it has been since 1783. Water supply to Crimea assured Ukraine remains neutral. And Andriy Melnik said, fuck off is my very diplomatic reply to you. Let him, let him eat each other in the replies, dude. I was calling Musk a Russian asset back in June on chat, trying to figure out why no one is concerned with NASA ties, satellite ops, and economic power in the U.S. People who are saying Melnick is a Holocaust revisionist, by the way. Brother, that's why I'm saying I'm not touching this, okay? I'm just watching it happen. <laughs> not exactly a fan. I'm surprised Elon Musk hasn't called someone a pedophile yet in this story. Every part of this peace deal is pretty reasonable, except for the first point about annexation in eastern Ukraine. Yes. 
Uh, I, I already mentioned that. Um, maybe Musk wants to not support anymore. Having the U.S. funded stuff allows him to not be the blame if something really bad happens. I'd rather shit on myself than listen to your politician bullshit. Can I come over and shit all over that MAGA hat, bro? Bro, it seems like you got some poopy stuff going on. It seems like this is a kink, my friend. It's kind of weird. Kind of a weird kink. Why is the first part so bad if that's the will of the people? Because the Crimean conversation is more com uh, more complicated than the Annex region conversation. The Annex region is fucking annexed by force. Like, at this stage, if they held elections there, you don't even have enough fucking people. Uh, there are so many people that have been displaced. The regions don't look like what it was. You know what I mean? People will say so was Crimea while refusing to recognize that LPR and DPR, and I'm not even talking about the, even the broader Eastern Ukrainian territories in general, but LPR and DPR have been in a fucking 14 year trench warfare with like rocket systems and, and airplanes bombing each other 14 or not 14, sorry, since 2014 with 14,000 people dying before Russia even invaded. That's not just something you can say. That's not just something you can fucking uh, uh, point to and be like, oh yeah, this area is Russian now. That's bullshit. There's a difference between that and Crimea, which is something that I think even Ukrainian leadership understood, which is precisely why even Zelensky himself had originally said in the 15-point peace negotiations with Russia that were being conducted in Antalya before they blew up, okay, that uh, they would push back the Crimean territorial uh, conflict 15 years into the future. LPR and DPR's vote to separate from Ukraine and whatever, ultimately, uh, it comes off the heels of eight years of war. All of those areas have been, uh, all of those areas and the demographics in those areas have, have changed so drastically, especially especially in recent years, especially in the immediate aftermath of the Russian invasion. There is also a particular reason why instead of Ukraine trying to retake Crimea in a similar capacity, they just fucking blew up. They put it, they dammed the river and moved on. They just cut off their water and moved on instead of trying to also forcibly retake Crimea. Understand? Which, by the way, was a human rights violation. I, I have mentioned that before. <sighs> Which is why I have said time and time again that the best possible way, the best possible outcome to have stopped this dead in its tracks and avoid thousands of, of casualties and millions of people being displaced uh, was to reinstitute by force the Minsk agreements, which would have made sure that LPR and DPR still remained within the borders of Ukraine while having autonomy. human rights violations so not a real violation of anything because there's no punishment associated with any human rights violations i mean human rights violations is something that people use only when they're talking about something that people use only when they're talking about fucking what do you call it uh, uh you know when it's a smaller non-state actor doing anything but the issue now is i don't even think that they can do that i i don't i, I don't foresee a world in which I do not foresee a world in which the Eastern territories that have now been annexed and are firmly considered by the Russian constitution, which I don't give a fuck about, uh, uh, that, it, that is now considered by Russia to be Russian territory. It's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous, unacceptable thing.
I don't see a Minsk three happening anytime soon. No. But you absolutely cannot redo elections of annex regions under UN supervision, especially now inside of said annex regions, because millions of people have fucking been displaced or, you know, thousands have been killed. Millions have been displaced. Like, what, what do you mean? How are you going to do that? Like, there are people that lost their homes and shit. You know what I mean? It's completely unacceptable. What's also hilarious to me in particular, what I see, what I am surprised other people don't, is that you have one fucking guy with an immense amount of power doing, like, statecraft. You know what I mean? Why is Elon Musk involving himself in these fucking affairs? How does he get a say in the matter? And people are not even taking a step back and going, well, that's kind of crazy that one guy is like literally having a conversation with Vladimir Putin and then uh, is, you know, uh, uh, having a say and trying to do a Twitter poll, which is like laughable. Like, who are you polling, man? You're polling random people on Twitter. You're polling bots on this kind of thing. This is how we're cutting foreign policy. This is how we're actually going to, to, to end conflict is crazy. I mean, the poll results did say no, though. Brother, that poll is meaningless. <laughs> what the fuck? Don't even validate it. <sighs> Doesn't matter what that poll says. This is a fucking... You're falling in the rookie hole. You do not conduct diplomacy with fucking Twitter polls that are so malleable to outside influence. Wait, hold up. I got to fucking do something real quick. God damn it. One second. I'll be back in a moment. Hold on. We're good. I think it's crazy that one man has the power to subject people to the top of the hour ad break when they could avoid those ads with the Amazon Prime subscription is... That's devastating. I have one thing that I love, and that is to serve you the top of the hour ad breaks by debating you. You just robbed me of that. I hope you feel happy that you took away my joy. And I know you are. I should have never read that. Zagon6, thank you for the 10 tier one gift subs, allowing 10 people to no longer see the ads. Here's the one minute ad break now. Shrinwreck, thank you for the fog of the subs. I will be watching the Warnock debate, yes.
radical liberal Raphael Warnock is going to dismantle our boy, Herschel Walker. Kanye West is going to be on Drink Champs again tomorrow. This is going to be insane. This is going to be completely unhinged. I cannot wait for it. Thank you. Okay. Very interesting statement from Elon Musk regarding Starlink and how damaging it is for SpaceX economics. Being Ukrainian actually in the topic of Spar uh, being Ukrainian actually in the topic of Starlinks, I want to tell you some base facts regarding Starlinks in Ukraine. I admire the actions of SpaceX enabling Starlink services in Ukraine. It is a true game changer for the Ukrainian army in open fields with no cellular and long distances not suitable for radios. Where is my towel? Thank you for the five. Get the subs. Given the situation is changing quick on the battlefield, is a game changer. Despite that, I have not seen any Starlink, which was bought by the governments or by SpaceX. All the Starlinks I have seen slash used were bought either by volunteers like myself or soldiers with their personal putting their personal money in. The subscription price is also paid out of pocket. In my charity fund, I bought and delivered to the front lines over fifty Starlinks. Some of them are still being paid for by my credit card with sixty cents each, sixty dollars each month. Pick. Related, one more Starlink I bought and paid for for Ukrainian EOD unit for the Kharkiv, Kharkiv Offensive. I would be very curious to see actual transparency on the process of getting Starlinks up and running in Ukraine, all the hidden costs that Elon claims, because Ukrainians pay the same price as everyone else, but it's only for Ukraine that is a subject of discussion for Elon Musk. I have bought over 50 Starlinks with official prices from the website in EU countries, Poland, CZ, and Germany, like 400, 500 bucks each. Then enabled portability for the extra, if I recall correctly, $50. Then paid monthly fee of $60 was $120 before. It's the same for everyone else in the EU. My question is, why is Ukraine so special for Elon Musk in the sense of operating SpaceX and Starlink? I don't get the answers from the interview he did with CNN exclusive, especially given the numbers they claim. I think this is far from reality. And here is another bank statement. Um, I think the answer is uh, easy. And that is that uh, he just wants to milk it. It's called price gouging. That's it. He, he's like, why is everybody else making a fucking killing off the war when I can't get more money from the American federal government? Yeah, it's war profiteering. And uh, it's a staple of the American economy. Seems like Elon is just getting in on the fun. The difference is, of course, he made it seem like he was doing this out of the kindness of his heart and then went and had a conversation with Vladimir Putin right before he decided, okay, I'm, not, I'm no longer doing this out of the kindness of my heart. I'm doing this for money, even though he was always doing it for money. Now he's doing it for even more money. This, of course, makes it... Uh, th this, of course, is additionally ironic because... A lot of the Starlink and uh, SpaceX technology is heavily subsidized by the federal government to begin with. It is also uh, working off the platform that, uh, you know, federal government funded research, NASA, has conducted. And it oftentimes even directly uses uh, people that they hired through NASA. So it's basically getting into the defense contractor game in an identical capacity to every other corporation. This is exactly what Boeing does. This is exactly what Lockheed Martin does. This is what they all do. Tax dollars work in this capacity in every field. The insider, Kremlin-linked officers seek asylum in France. 
A member of Russia's security service, FSB, and a member of the Russian mercenary organization, Wagner, have requested asylum in France. Testimonies provided will shed light on Russia's war crimes in Ukraine. DOD contractors having contact with foreign enemy powers is always a good idea. Yeah, well, DOD contractors being so, uh, you know, in the spotlight and then uh, doing so makes it additionally worse. Anyway, um, how does it feel to be a racist piece of shit? Says less than JK. I don't know. Ask your dad. Which is the reason why I fucked your mom. Wait, what is he trying to say? Is he trying to say that I'm racist against Elon? An African American person? That's pretty bold coming from a racist. Fucking what? That's crazy. I want to hear more from this guy. We will check back in with him. Roasted by a scene kit? Yeah, I know. It, it kind of broke me a little bit. Okay. Please. Words that I, uh, of course, knew that I would always repeat, but still sucks to say. Juvenile in custody after at least five killed in a shooting in North Carolina. In Raleigh, North Carolina, have arrested a juvenile suspect in a brazen series of killings there. Five people were shot to death yesterday, including an off-duty police officer along a pub public path in a residential area. Police swarmed the neighborhood searching for the shooter. Lise Preston is outside a hospital in Raleigh where at least one of the victims is in critical, is in critical condition at this hour. Elise, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Gail. Police have not released any more information about the person hospitalized here or those four other victims killed. They say the suspected shooter is an underage white male. His alleged crimes, in the words of the state's governor, terrorize this usually quiet area for hours. Raleigh police raced through these residential streets around sunset Thursday, responding to reports of an active shooter. Oh, I Cell phone video appears to show law enforcement searching the area for the suspect. Five people were shot and killed, including an off-duty police officer. We have an officer down. We have an officer down. I've never seen so many cops. Like, I'm shaking and terrified to go home and sleep tonight. Then some four hours after the first reports of gunfire, police confirmed the juvenile had been taken into custody. The suspect had been contained at a residence. There's no active ongoing threat in the community at this time. Among the two injured, a Raleigh police canine officer who was released from the hospital Thursday night. And it's not just in Raleigh. Across the nation, seven officers have been wounded and five killed by gunfire so far this week. This year, 55 law enforcement officers have been killed. They, they moved quickly away from this being a, yet another mass shooting with an easily accessible weapon to, well, a cop got shot. Let's talk about how uh, scary it is to be a cop. Killed compared to 62 in all of last year. Among those killed this week, Connecticut officers Dustin DeMonte and Alex Hamsey. They were apparently ambushed Wednesday after a false 911 call. A third officer, Alec Urato, was injured but was released from the hospital to applause Thursday morning. Back in Raleigh, a call for change. We must stop this mindless violence in America. We must. That's a weird, I did not assume the direction to go there. Update, sources have confirmed for the NNO that the suspect in Thursday's mass shooting is a 15-year-old. I'm not going to say their name. Um, a sophomore at Nightdale High School and the brother of 16-year-old shooting victim. I'm not going to say their name either. 
Yeah. Here's what we know. Sources have confirmed that the suspect is a 15-year-old and a sophomore at Nightdale, Nightdale High School and the brother of one of the victims. Brother was 16 years old. Uh, the person is hospitalized in critical condition at Wake Med. The, uh, the suspect is. Where he was taken after being captured by the police Thursday night. Um... Neighbor said he lived with his father, a handyman in the neighborhood, and would help on odd jobs. Several described unusual behavior from the son. I used to see him at 4.30, 5 in the morning with a book bag on, said a neighbor. Buses don't run till 7 in the morning. Burris Thompson, who's unrelated to the victim with the same last name, said he normally works out in his garage, but something kept him from the habit Thursday night. I could have, I could have been a victim myself, he said. Um, he was hospitalized after his capture. The suspect was hospitalized after his capture late Thursday. The nature of his injuries have not been released yet. A long standoff unfolded Thursday evening, police chief Estella Patterson said. The police, of course, or not of course, sorry. The police, as of now, have yet to discuss the motive or circumstances of the shooting. They've declined, but promised to share more details in five days. In North Carolina, police prepare five-day reports outlining what transpired during a significant crime incident, usually when a police officer shoots someone. It's not clear yet whether the suspect knew any of the victims other than his brother. Police have also declined to say. Patterson said the gunman shot people in the streets of Headingham neighborhood, then fled in the direction of the News River Greenway Trail, where he continued shooting. Um... The victims are identified as his brother, who was 16 years old, Gabrielle Torres, 29, Mary Marshall, 34, Susan Carnats, 49, and Nicole Connors, 53. Torres, a Raleigh police officer, was on his way to work when he was shot. Patterson said the crime scene spanned two miles and the investigation is ongoing. Um, authorities have not said what type of weapon the shooter used, a 911 caller, Said he was dressed in camouflage and carrying a long gun and a backpack. Some people suspect it might be shotgun. Yes, other than his uh other than his brother he killed I think uh other than his brother he killed what uh, not all women but and now he is in uh critical condition. Fifteen years old. When you say uh, no, no apparent motive as of now. This guy just said that and then left. That's crazy. Holy shit, dude. We don't know if he shot himself and we do not know if the police shot him. Don't know. The Warnock-Walker debate is going to happen tonight. It's going to happen at 4 p.m. in like around 40 minutes. We will be watching it when it happens. At 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We will be watching it when it happens, of course. What's that in Alaskan time? Man, I don't fucking know. Yeah, there's no love for the UTC frogs either. Motherfuckers be like, what's that in Alaska time? I said 40 minutes from now. 
I know Alaskan time is different, but address gun violence. And we expect to learn more about the victims killed, the wounded, and the suspected shooter at a news conference this morning. Tony? Uh, Governor Roy Cooper called it the, the nightmare of every community. At least, thank you very much. And, and we turn to an update. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to cover the Parkland families. Oh, fuck. Ow, that sneeze was, that hurt, sneeze hurt my neck. I really hope I didn't twist it again. Uh, I'm not going to cover the Parkland parents again. We already did that. Um, I will look at why there's no such thing as a good billionaire by a friend of the show, Adam Conover. Um, but here's more details. Uh, actually, I don't even know if there's any more details, but a handgun and a long gun were recovered after the shooting. That's all they're saying. They're not saying if it's an AR-15 or a shotgun. And the suspect carried camouflage, carried a camouflage backpack, according to a source with the knowledge over the investigation. Uh, one of the victims was an off-duty Raleigh police officer, Gabriel Torres, who was on his way to work. Mass shooting came one day after two police officers were killed and another seriously wounded. Enough, President Joe Biden said in a statement Friday, we've grieved and prayed with too many families who have had to bear the terrible burden of these mass shootings. The president added, we must pass an assault weapons ban. The American people support this common sense action to get the weapons off these streets. And everyone went back to their usual rhetoric. Back to daily programming. Okay. Huh. Officials have a few details about what happened in the quiet middle class Raleigh neighborhood, but said the crime scene extended over two miles. We already covered that. Carnitz's husband, Tom, called her wife a loving wife and mother to three sons, ages 10, 13, and 14. We will miss her greatly. We've had plans together for growing old, always together. Now those plans are laid to waste. That's so fucking bad, dude. My dad was friends with the victim, Nicole Connors. Sorry to hear that. I'm sorry for your loss. Christine Hines said she was having yard work done at her home Thursday afternoon when a gunfire erupted. Sirens blared. An officer yelled at her to get back in the house when she went to close the patio door. I want to leave the area, and then I have to consider that there's really no perfect place, Hines said. As soon as this is this is as close as I've seen, but I'm not sure if I want to stay. Hines recalled seeing Sue Carnets earlier Thursday. They walked their dogs, but at the same time each day on opposite sides of the street because the pets don't get along. Knowing her neighbor is gone, Hines said, feels like her heart had been pierced. Of the teen suspects, Hines lamented life hasn't even begun for him. An officer in an unmarked car told him there was an active shooter. They locked themselves in their bedroom. House passes a bill to create Amber Alert-like system for active shooting situations. 168 Republicans and one Democrat voted against it. What leads you to do that? Like, I, I, I don't even understand. Like, what the fuck's happening? Republicans were less unified in their vote. 43 voting in favor, 168 voting against it. During a debate over the bill, Representative Matt Gates, a Republican from Florida, said an active shooter system alert designed to make people hate their Second Amendment rights. The Independent reported. Oh, my God. There is no fucking way, dog. There is no fucking way, dude. Dude, America is so... I didn't even know this. Yo, America is insane, bro. Why do Democrats want to use the power of the government to bombard your cell phone with active shooter alerts 24 hours a day, seven days a week? He's admitting that it happens all the time.
This goes beyond treating mass shootings like a naturally occurring phenomena, which Americans do, right? They do it all the time. But this goes even beyond that because, like, even for, even for like, uh, naturally occurring phenomena, at least you got, like, defense systems in place. You got, like, this level of, of uh, you know, offering people the information to, to defend themselves. Like, at least you get tornado warnings because there's no fucking tornado lobby. If someone was making, if someone was making money off the tornadoes, and I don't mean, like, people like Reed Timmer, friend of the show, you bet your fucking ass these guys would be running around saying, you know what? We should not be letting people be afraid of tornadoes. We should be fighting to make sure that nobody knows about tornadoes. We should be embracing them. Representative David Cicilline, a Democrat from Rhode Island, helped introduce the bill in February during National Police Week in May. Law enforcement often has to rely on social media to communicate active shooter threats. Jonathan Thompson, the executive director and the CEO of the National Sheriff's Association, approved the bill. Having a capacity to send immediate active shooter alerts to the community will be instrumental in reducing risk to schools. And 11 police organizations gave the bill their stamp of approval. And we still, dude, that's nuts. Republicans are so wild, dude. The mayor emphasized the widespread gun violence must be stopped. We have work to do, but there are too many victims. We have to wake up. I don't want other mayors standing here at the podium with their hearts breaking because people in their community died today needlessly and tragically. 531 mass shootings this year. Honestly, even fucking, like, even gun control uh, to a certain degree is, like, beneficial for the police force. The Supreme Court meets Andy Warhol, Prince, in a case that could threaten creativity? Oh, no. On one side is the dispute is Lynn Goldsmith, famous for photographing rock stars whose works are more than 100 albums. In 1981, Goldsmith was commissioned to shoot a series of photos for Prince for Newsweek. At the time, the Purple Rain rock star was just starting to take off. Goldsmith photographed him in concert, invited him to their studio, <clears throat> gave, her, gave him purple eyeshadow, lip gloss. She even set her photography umbrellas to create pin pricks of lights of his eyes. The result was an image that she could later say was a portrait of vulnerability. Newsweek didn't use the studio photo, opting instead to use the concert photo, and Goldsmith kept the other photos and files for further publication and licensing. Three years later, Prince was a superstar, and Vanity Fair magazine commissioned Andy Warhol to make an illustration of Prince for an article it was running. In commissioning the work, the magazine asked Warhol to use a reference point of one of Goldsmith's black and white photos. The magazine paid Goldsmith 400 in licensing fees and promised in writing to use the image only in this one Vanity Fair issue. There is no evidence in the record that Warhol knew about the licensing agreement, but in any event, he went beyond it and created a set of 16 prints silk screens, which he copyrighted, and one of which Vanity Fair used for the article. The silk screen images have since been sold and reproduced to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars in profits for the Andy Warhol Foundation. Oh, no. A nonprofit that was set up after Warhol's death to promote his work in the visual arts. After Prince died... Condé Nast expedited a tribute to the genius of Prince featuring many Prince's photographs, and it paid the Warhol Foundation $10,250 to run orange prints on its cover. Goldsmith, of course, only got $400 originally, right? And she eventually sued the foundation, claiming that Warhol had infringed on her copyright and that the foundation owes her potentially millions of dollars in unpaid licensing fees and royalties. I don't think that that... I, I do not think... I do not think that uh, the courts will side with her. It's a weird circumstance because she is like the wronged party, technically. But also at the same time, uh, what she wants is almost like an NFT. You know what I mean? What she wants is basically to be able to continue making money off of her original work of art 
which now has moved beyond what she has done and has turned into and has turned into something entirely different. Foundation asserted that in Warhol's version, not only did Warhol crop the image and remove Prince's torso, but he resized the image, altered the angle of Prince's face, changed the tones, lighting, and detail, in addition to adding layers of bright and unnatural colors, conspicuous and hand-drawn outlines, inline screens, and stark back shading that exaggerated Prince's features. So here is the original on the left. And this is what Andy Warhol did with it on the right. I think that all art is technically derivative. Andy Warhol's art is a little bit more derivative than others. It's it's like the bit itself is how derivative it is. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't know. This would be a terrifying copyright precedent to set. I'm from Pittsburgh. How dare you slander? I'm from Pittsburgh and I will come to LA to confront you on this. This motherfucker is signing off from a toaster because of my uh, jokes about Pittsburgh yesterday. That's insane. Actually crazy. Yinzer's on that 24-hour mobile delay. You know what I'm saying? See, he can't even respond. Because he can't hear what I'm saying. He's going to respond tomorrow. He's not going to respond for another 24 hours. He's like, I heard what you had to fucking say. Uh, he said, I hear you. <laughs> oh, no. Pittsburgh is on. Is no longer on mobile. Watch out, chat. Anyway, the foundation countered that Warhol not only copyrighted his iconic Prince series, but his treatment was in legal terms transformative because our artistic rendering is very different than Goldsmith's original photo. Yeah. I think you're just literally looking at this and going, well, it's the fucking pho photographer. But I, I don't like IP, man. I don't. I don't like it at all. I think photographers are going to get mad at me for saying this, but I don't like IP at all. Because especially when it comes to art, because art is supposed to be derivative. All art is derivative. You know? Ah. <sighs> I'm a photographer who's had their photos jacked and reposted a lot. I don't give a fuck. No, I mean, that's still bullshit. Like, no one should jack your photos and repost it. You should still get paid for your direct work. Are you saying a company should be able to use his work without paying him? No.
She deserves something. The law will probably say $400 is all she deserves, which is fucked up and wrong. I just, I am afraid. I am personally afraid of what this could turn into. You know? However, Supreme Court rules this decision will have a rippling practical consequences, so it's no surprise that there are three dozen friend-of-the-court briefs that have been filed arguing on one side or the other and representing everyone from the American Association of Publishers and the Motion Picture Association of America to the Library of Futures Institute, Digital Media License Association, Dr. Seuss, and the Recording Industry Association of America, and even the union that represents NPR's reporters, editors, Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. Wait, which side are they on? Why are they not saying it? The outcome could shift a lot of favor, more control by the original artist, but by doing that, you could also inhibit artists and other content creators who build on existing work and everything from music and posters to AI creations and documentaries. For example, the Juice World Sting lawsuit was a good case to look at. They decided it wasn't transformative enough, and Juice World had to give like 70% of the money to Sting. Yeah. I think crediting the original is always adequate. Oh, I don't know. I just, I personally think that it is worrisome. If you are in the business of making content in any meaningful capacity. I've talked about this already. IP does not foster Company innovation, but, uh, but inhibits it. All right, let's talk about, uh, speaking of, you know, copyright infringement, let's watch friend of the show, Adam Conover's video. As I react to it. Makes overpriced vests for tech bros who pretend to be outdoorsy. Got a metric fuckload of good headlines this month when their billionaire owner, Yvonne Chouinard, announced that he was donating the entire company to fight climate change. Twitter exploded in jubilation. The Washington Post said, finally, a billionaire willing to smack back at capitalism. Even the beloved environmentalist Bill McKibben said, if every company was as decent as Patagonia, the world would work better and people would be cozy all winter. Now, this is a wonderful story. I would love to believe that there's a good billionaire out there looking out for the planet from atop his pile of money. But you can feel what's coming, can't you? I mean, I wouldn't be making this video if there weren't a darker truth to expose. Am I really gonna do this? Am I actually gonna disagree with Patagonia, the media, and Bill McKibben, a man I deeply respect and admire, and tell the world why this feel-good story is actually terrible? Yes. Fuck yeah, I am. Not only was this donation designed to help Chenard avoid billions of dollars in taxes, the fact that it's even possible for a billionaire to pull this maneuver is an unmitigated disaster for the planet and for our democracy. And when we swallow PR like this, we are literally falling for the oldest billionaire bullshit in the book. Now, a lot of people found this story believable, including me at first, because it fits Chenard's carefully cultivated public image. He's been described for years as the reluctant billionaire, a frugal rock climber who just loved making gear for his friends, then tripped and accidentally started a $3 billion company. People tell stories about Chenard eating cans of cat food to save money, and he famously still drives a Subaru instead of a fancy car. The dude supposedly doesn't even own a cell phone, which is maybe why he doesn't know that human food is just as cheap as cat food. You weren't saving money, Yvonne. You were just being weird. And as far as corporations go, Patagonia does have a solid environmental record. They've donated over $140 million to a huge number of organizations, promoting everything from land conservation to biodiversity to sustainable agriculture to the end of fossil fuels. Now, Chenard said that he wanted the company's commitment to the planet to continue after his death. So instead of selling the company to some corner-cutting capitalist who would start powering the fleeced vest factories with coal and, I don't know, cancel the Batgirl movie again, he decided to donate all of his stock to a nonprofit 
nonprofit organization with a mission of helping the planet. In a New York Times piece so glowing, it might as well have been written by his publicist. Chenard said that hopefully this donation will influence a new form of capitalism that doesn't end with a few rich people and a whole bunch of poor people. And his own accountant said that he'll receive no tax benefit for his donation whatsoever. But if you want the straight story about a billionaire's finances, it might make sense to ask someone other than the guy who cooks the books for him. The truth is, if Chenard really just wanted to make sure that Patagonia's value stayed intact, he didn't need to donate it to a nonprofit. He could have just given all $3 billion worth of shares to his kids. They could have kept running the company according to Daddy Dearest's wishes and lovingly rapped about him at corporate board meetings. So why didn't he do that? Simple. He would have had to pay $1.2 billion in gift taxes. And Yvonne's a good billionaire, so he doesn't like paying taxes. I mean, why should he have to pay for the roads his products are transported on, the schools and universities his workers are educated at, the GPS system that he uses to track his shipments, and the government research into heart attacks and cancer that have kept him alive until... Ultimately, my take on this uh, when it first came out was that it's all entirely dependent on how the funds get used and I'm not in the business of assuming that the dude is going to fucking absolutely use this as his personal uh, slush fund and uh, use this as a way to, like, avoid taxes and then, you know, uh, do his personal slush fund tax-free. I don't think that billionaires are good, obviously. There's no such thing. Um, and the adequate and good thing would be to turn your company into a more democratic turn your company into a more democratically uh, operated uh, structure Twitter lefties are going to love this one law I mean it's true though he's not wrong but like I said it could be look two things can be true one with when it's billionaires we're talking about, it's a race to the fucking bottom, okay? So this dude is doing something that is otherwise good, okay? But he's still utilizing the same uh, the, the the same mechanisms that are afforded, the same financial tools that are afforded to the mega wealthy to avoid paying taxes. If he uses this specifically like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or something like that, then it's fucked up. If, it, if he uses like Mark Zuckerberg does to just make better PR, to get better PR for himself, then that's kind of fucked up. Of course, those other companies still have regular for-profit operations going on, and they're only simply uh, taking the, the you know Bill Gates portion and dumping it into the Bill Gates 501c4, I believe, or is it a 501c3? Same with Mark Zuckerberg. Like a lot of a lot of billionaires do this shit where they're just like, hey man. And Bill Gates was like the first one who did it. Um, hey, we're just gonna I, I don't care about money anymore. Like, look at me. I'm doing so much charitable giving. The only difference though is that this fucking guy is a bit of a freak from the jump. Like he was always kind of like a weirdo, I just want to fucking climb rocks, I don't give a shit type dude. You know what I mean? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, whereas I am immediately going to be not as charitable because they are fucking billionaires. And uh, that means that like you have generated this profound amount of wealth by still exploiting uh, your wage laborers. Okay. But for him, it seems like it goes far beyond aesthetics. He's just like a straight up, yeah, as, as someone in the chat just said, straight up dirtbag climber. You know what I mean? So ultimately, he was all, yeah, he was always just a I want to climb rocks type dude, bro. He was always just a I want to climb rock types dude, bro. You know, that's just PR. Oh, you were making fun of me. No, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think that's just PR. No, I think he is like that.
But my favorite part of the story is the fact that this is yet another instance of a fundamental breakdown in capitalism. We should not be reliant on the magnanimous nature of billionaires. How many times do I have to fucking say this? That is inherently undemocratic just because one guy decided to be a dirtbag rock climber who happened to, uh, happened to be exploitative enough to make a billion, but also, uh, you know, simultaneously nice enough to fucking uh, try to revert those funds back into the fucking environment does not fundamentally fix the system. We cannot expect people out of the kindness of their own fucking hearts to get to this position of power and then turn around and be like, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to do good things. Okay. That's the reason why the system is not working. Because if philanthropy worked, there would be no need for philanthropy. <laughs> if the system worked, there would be no need for philanthropy. There just wouldn't. But the system is so fundamentally flawed that philanthropy is seen as a way to like plug some of the holes, which it doesn't, which it never does, because those philanthropic organizations also operate like a capitalist organization. With their CEOs making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, with a lot of the funds being reverted back in the marketing and not necessarily actual, you know, uh, boots on the ground help. That's the issue. Fucking sucks. <sighs> the only good billionaire is me. Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a billionaire. Until the ripe old age of 83. I mean, he's self made, right? He did it all by himself. Now I know what you're thinking. Adam, he didn't pay taxes because he did something better. He donated it to charity. Well, let's take a look at how charitable that donation actually was. 98% of the shares Shinar donated were given to a brand new environmental nonprofit he formed called the Holdfast Collective. Like, if that collective uses every single fucking dime generated from Patagonia directly back into like actively fighting for climate change which is highly unlikely but if they are supposed to do that then yeah that's good that's an overall good thing okay straight up that is overall a good thing but i don't think he's gonna do that but we'll see Kind of a weird name, sort of sounds like a mid-2000s Brooklyn indie band, but more about that in a second. The other 2% though, were Chenard's voting shares. These are the shares that let you actually control what the company does. And these shares were given to something called the Patagonia Purpose Trust, which is solely controlled by Chenard and his family. What this means is that even though all the headlines said Chenard was donating the company to charity, he and his family will continue to control Patagonia forever. You know, I didn't know that was how donations worked. When I donate my car to 1-800-CARS-FOR-KIDS, I can't show up the next weekend and take it for a joyride. But Yvonne and his family can. Now, the family did have to pay about $17 million in gift taxes to execute this maneuver. But don't forget, they already saved $1.2 billion by donating the other 98% to charity. So they came out roughly $1.2 billion ahead. That shit's not even a rounding error. So what about that other 98%? And who exactly is the Holdfast Collective? Well, they're actually pretty mysterious. They don't even have a website. And when you Google them, you just find a bunch of Reddit threads of people asking, what the hell is the Holdfast Collective? But what we do know from the New York Times is that the Holdfast Collective will receive roughly $100 million a year in profit from Patagonia, and that they plan to use that money to influence the US political system. See, regular nonprofits are what's called 501c3s. 501c3s are required to use the money for charitable purposes and are barred from making political contributions. But the Holdfast Collective is a 501c4, and that means it's allowed to use that money to donate to politicians, super PACs, and even to... Can you admit that the tax which is going to the military industrial complex? Brother, that's an anti-tax take. I don't know what community you, you're in, you think you're in, but that's insane. Yes, a chunk of it will go to the military industrial complex, but also a gigantic percentage of it will still go back to social security funds and... and uh, social services, rather, sorry, and, and infrastructure. These are, these are, you know, incredibly important uh, uh, funds that, that still need money. 
Another good video on the subject. Yeah, I'm not going to watch Hassan Minhaj again from 2019. We've watched it so many times. Conduct direct political campaigning. And since it's safe to assume that the Holdfast Collective is going to be basically run by the Chouinard family, considering they founded it and control its money supply, that means Yvonne was able to take his $3 billion company and turn it into a $3 billion political influence machine tax free. He didn't pay capital gains tax on the growth of the company. He didn't pay the income tax that I would have to pay before I donate to my favorite 501c4. And he definitely didn't pay the gift taxes you normally have to pay if you want to give $3 billion in money and political influence to your kids. That's right, Patagonia made the jackets, but it was the rest of us who got fleeced. That's a Patagonia pun. Let's be clear. Because of their control of Patagonia and Holdfast, Chenard's descendants are going to wield massive political power for their entire lives. They're going to be invited to meetings with powerful elected leaders. They'll be flown around the world to conferences. They'll be lauded as great philanthropists until the day they die when their kids will take over as money bags in chief. Chenard has turned his money into permanent political power for him and his descendants, and I do not think he should get a tax break for doing it. And look, I'll grant Chenard's good intentions here. I think that in addition to wanting to save money on his taxes, he and his family are motivated by a sincere desire to help the planet. And I think their donation, taken in isolation, will do that. But we can't take it in isolation. Because Chenard is not the only billionaire pulling this move. And the other billionaires are a lot less cuddly than Mr. Puffer Vest for the planet. Let's talk about a different billionaire named Barry Side. The wonderful investigative journalism outfit ProPublica did an expose this year on Side when he pulled the exact same move as Yvonne, he donated his entire fortune to charity. But Twitter and the New York Times didn't throw a party in Barry's honor. Why? Because the charity he donated to was run by Leonard Leo, the right-wing activist yeah. who spent the last couple decades stacking the... This was fair. Like, this is fair. Uh, to, to make this comparison, even though, like, one part of it... To make the comparison when you talk about the underlying problem is fair. Obviously, the actions of this is infinitely worse than the overarching actions of the potential Patagonia Fund which will probably be for good because I am a pussy who cares about the environment, who believes that, uh, and also who believes that there is a difference between, you know, good things and bad things like uh, caring about the environment and shifting our over-reliance on fossil fuel energy, the renewable resources, that's a good thing. Whereas like, uh, I don't know, killing fucking uh, women or jailing women for, for uh, getting an abortion is a bad thing. I know, I know, I'm sorry kind of fucked up but i do believe that uh that that is a bad thing and uh you know that's what the federalist society basically operates to do so hot take hot take man i know but functionally what he's doing is is uh taking advantage of a similar structure possibly for good Supreme Court with radical conservatives. You know, the same conservatives who recently overturned Roe v. Wade and banned the EPA from regulating greenhouse gases. Cheering on Chenard's abuse of the system just because you agree with his cause doesn't make sense. It's like cheering for a baseball player who does steroids. Sure, it's nice when he hits a home run for your team, but when all the other teams are doing it too, you get your ass kicked and it kind of fucks the game up. It's also, how to put this, the opposite of democracy. See, everyone sees the world differently and everyone has different needs. And that means that no one person has all the answers. So the central insight of democracy is that we need to spread power widely and diversely among many different types of people if we want to solve our biggest problems. But billionaires like Chenard are doing the opposite. He's hoarding power, even if he feels that he's using it for good. But why should the owner of a fancy clothing company get to decide what's good or not? Why don't we all decide it? together. You know, maybe the billionaires could kick in their fair share to a communal pool of money we all contribute to, and then we could vote on what to spend it on. I don't know, just a crazy idea I found on this dusty old scroll. But no, instead, our system allows a few wealthy people to amass disgusting amounts of wealth and then gives them a tax break when they use it to influence our political system. And that is no way to run a society. 
Democracy only works when everybody has a voice. So instead of applauding Chouinard, we do a lot better to take that power back for ourselves. Now, I think that argument is pretty straightforward. Open and shut, video could end right there. Except that when I posted about this on Twitter, I was deluged with hate from angry billionaire fans. And I started to realize that something deeper is going on here. I mean, people really love this cat food eating, Subaru driving, I mean, it's not even him. Like, I don't think he's a good example of like, uh, I mean, I guess maybe he's the best example for the reasons because like, uh, you know, he is someone that is uh, universally recognized as like a, like a good person, right? Rather than someone like Elon Musk, for example, who is recognized, hopefully, as a bad person by at least some. Um. Elon didn't make graduation though. Okay, we're not even talking about Kanye, man. Holy shit. Being humble billionaire who cares. I gotta and warn my chicken boys. Hold on. If you criticize him. I mean, he's got a great brand and people love it. I love it too. I love my Patagonia jacket. When I wear it, I feel like I'm in that Wes Anderson movie where Bill Murray is sad in the 60s. No, not that one, the other one. No, not that one, the other one. No, not that one, the other. That's the one, thank you. All right, there's three more though. But here's the problem. That story, that brand isn't real. It's PR, it's marketing, it's spin, baby. Let me tell you about a little place called Bentonville, Arkansas. So a few weeks back, I was booked to MC an event at Crystal Bridges Art Museum in Bentonville, a beautiful small town in northwestern Arkansas that also happens to be the home of one of the most lavish and expensive art museums in America. Why there? <laughs> well, a clue might be in the name you see emblazoned all over town, Walmart. Sam Walton opened the first Walmart store in Bentonville in 1962, and now that it's the largest retailer in the world, yes, larger than Amazon, its headquarters are still in Bentonville. Sam Walton is now dead, but his kids, the 11th, 12th, and 13th richest people in America, have poured money into the town. They've built miles of bike trails all around the surrounding area. They've preserved the beautiful, historic town square, and they've built a $200 million art museum. But that's not the only museum I visited in Bentonville that weekend. Housed in a replica of an old-fashioned five-and-dime store is the Walmart Museum, a monument to Sam Walton's humility and humble decency. They have Oh, this is so good. The absolute worst of the worst motherfuckers. An exact replica of his shabby home office, which actually like brought a tear to my eye because it reminded me so strongly of my own grandfather's office when I was a kid. And according to this museum, Sam hated money so much that he drove a beat up old truck. And to prove it, they put the beat up old truck in the museum. Holy shit, swap the pickup for a Subaru and this could be the Patagonia Museum. Now there's something a little perverse in building an entire museum to tell people how humble and thrifty you are, but it works. People in this town love the Waltons. And when I struck up a conversation with them, they talked about the Waltons like they were family. Because of the Waltons investment, the population of Bentonville has sextupled. Property values have skyrocketed. Oh, and don't forget the- So no different to Bezos then? I mean, every billionaire does the same thing because it's effective PR, it's effective propaganda. That's why they do it. It's effective marketing. That's it world-class art museum they built in town where Bentonville residents can chill out and look at a rock Sex. Co, listen to an artist of color, give a talk, or visit one of Yayoi Kasuma's famous infinity rooms. When I was waiting in line for this exhibit, I overheard two teenagers talking about how they had never- No, it's not the same way that gangs will provide food for the neighborhood. That's a means of survival. What are you talking about? No, gangs provide food for the neighborhood because- there is a secondary community component within gangs, especially when you're talking about underserved, uh, uh, underserved neighborhoods. We're not talking about fucking doing PR. It's not even one is one is built around uh, uh, community development out of necessity and survival. The other is like literally someone who is like fucking uh, has his tentacles in every aspect of society and is doing it legally and and you know is doing it specifically so that they can fucking. Uh, so that they don't get uh, yelled at. Your Reddit mods are trash? What?
Man, just got Foss about it. 10 bucks is the wrong Reddit. I don't even, oh God, I just. Never been to an art museum before and oh, no. hearing that, you know, made my heart swell up. Like this is a part of the country that has been left out of cultural investment for a century and the Waltons are changing that. That is unequivocally a good thing. But there's also a deep irony in Bentonville that makes visiting it almost creepy because even though the Waltons have preserved this perfect American small town, they only had the money to do so because they have destroyed the downtowns of so many other cities in America. According to a 2008 study from MIT, Walmart was responsible for 40 to 50% of the decline in small discount stores like the ones their museum was built to resemble. Other researchers found that when Walmart comes to town, it correlates with increased obesity, higher crime rates, and lower overall employment in that area. And this proves that the narrative Sam Walton spun about himself, that he never cared about money. He was just a humble guy who loved giving back. Well, it was bullshit. There are no accidental billionaires. The only way to make that kind of money is on purpose. This dude devoted his life to building the biggest, most profitable company he could, and then he used that money to tell a sweet and cuddly story about himself to distract from all the evil shit he did. And even though I don't think the average Patagonia wearer is a big fan of Walmart, it bears pointing out how closely the story Chouinard tells about himself resembles Walton's. The reluctant billionaire rock climber who doesn't care about money, drives a beat up old car, and loves giving back is a great story but it's also marketing, and Chouinard tells it because it benefits him and Patagonia to do so. I mean, how many made in Vietnam puffer vests have they sold over the years because somebody looked at them and said, hey, he's the good billionaire, I'm gonna help him save the planet. Hell, if you go to patagonia.com right now, they are using that story to sell you more overpriced crap. But look, none of this is new. The truth is that billionaires have been telling this story about themselves since the first proto-capitalist took his first quivering steps out of the money swamp. Let's do a quick review of the Billionaire Bullshit Hall of Fame. Mark Zuckerberg got incredible headlines when he said he was donating his fortune to charity in 2015. Then it turned out that charity was just an LLC he controls that invests in for-profit businesses. For years- Like, do you see what I mean? That is different, right? It's still different than like what the Patagonia thing is doing, but that is only if you want to believe that he's a good dude. Okay. Only if you believe that he's a benevolent person and that in and of itself is a, a silly childish way to operate. We should not expect benevolence from billionaires and we should not be relying on the benevolence of billionaires. Because even if one of them is, is genuinely a good person, it's still dumb as fuck. Years, people have described Bill Gates as saving the world. He even made his own Netflix documentary about what a generous genius he is. Of course, that's before we learned he's a serial sexual harasser who became best buddies with Jeffrey Epstein after he was convicted of sex crimes. Bill True. was like, oh, this dude's a sex offender? Well, what's he doing Thursday? And finally, Warren Buffett, a man who decades of PR have described as so saintedly frugal that websites post listicles about how you can live as cheaply as him, with tips like eat a cheap breakfast. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if I ate Egg McMuffins all day, it wouldn't make me a billionaire. I'd just have a heart attack. I mean, this article literally says that Warren Buffett clips coupons. No, he fucking doesn't. Are you trying to tell me that Warren fucking Buffett gets up on a Tuesday, goes and gets the newspaper off his porch, takes out the advertising section and a pair of scissors and says, oh, look, Skippy is on sale? Fuck you, how gullible do you think we are? You know how Warren really saves money? By not paying his taxes. When also, if he's doing that, he's mentally ill. I'm sorry, that's not like him being a good, kind, frugal person. He's just severely and deeply mentally ill. 
ProPublica got a leak of billionaire tax returns, Buffett was found to pay the least of any of his fellow plutocrats. Dude made $24 billion between 2014 and 2018 and paid a true tax rate of 0.1%. Even greedy little piggies like Bezos and Musk can't touch that. Instead of paying the public the money he owes us, Buffett has famously pledged to give away his money to charity. Which charity, you might ask? Oh, just the one his buddy Bill runs with the ex-wife he cheated on. Wow, billionaires donating to billionaires brings a tear to your eye, doesn't it? Now, if all of this weren't enough for you, it becomes piercingly clear that the entire concept of billionaire charity is bullshit when you look at where it originated. In the Gilded Age of the late 19th century, the OG evil monopolist Andrew Carnegie wrote an essay called The Gospel of Wealth, in which he famously argued that it's the responsibility of the We're gonna move on to the to Herschel Walker debate in a second. During their lifetimes. He even argued that it's the duty of a rich man to set an example of modest, unostentatious living, shunning display or extravagance. So Chenard and Walton weren't radicals by driving beat up old cars. They were literally taking their instructions from Daddy Carnegie. Now critically, Carnegie argued for that kind of charity because he believed that the system that gave him such unimaginable wealth was a good thing and that it was inevitable. It was just the way of the universe. But even at the time, in the late 19th century, Americans knew that this was bullshit. They knew that Carnegie's wealth was the result of a broken system. Especially then, because there was a viable leftist movement. And that it came at the expense of the customers he gouged, the workers he exploited, and the political system he dominated. A political system that ensured workers had no right to organize, no minimum wage, and allowed plutocrats to hire thugs to beat the shit out of them whenever they asked for their fair share. Carnegie's Gilded Age concealed a rot at the core of the economy. And in the years after his death, the country went through a little something called the Great Depression. Huh. Turns out letting so much wealth accumulate in so few hands wasn't a great idea. The New Deal that Franklin Delano Roosevelt launched in response was strongly influenced by progressive reformers who were alarmed at the excesses of Gilded Age plutocrats like Carnegie. Roosevelt introduced stronger labor protections, a minimum wage, strong antitrust enforcement so that monopolies couldn't form, and perhaps most importantly, a high level of taxation on the wealthy. And it worked. The labor movement flourished, which led directly to the creation of the American middle class. Average Americans, average white Americans anyway, were able to make a living wage, save for retirement, and build wealth of their own. Wealthy people still existed, and they were still able to make money, but the age of 